Take your Bibles. Can we mute this? Is this on a separate channel? Because it's really weird. Like I'm like literally preaching to myself like six inches away. If not, it'll be okay. But I thought I would ask. I would invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn it to John chapter 3. It's all right, Courtney, don't worry about it. I'll be okay. I do want to say as we begin, the kids make their way out to Children's Church. Um, back, I was probably still fall, Debbie messaged me about putting together a Christmas choir. Of course, we didn't have any issues with that. And uh, thank you, guys. And um, she, of course, gets the material, and she gives it to me, and she says, hey, will you check this out? Will you read through it? And I kind of perused through it a little bit. Didn't pay a ton of detail to it. Very much trust uh, Debbie's judgment and her discernment as she's looking through that to make sure that everything is, in fact, in accord with Scripture. Um, and the reason I want to tell you that this morning is because we did not work together. Uh, we did not plan their program and where I would land this morning um, and how it is that we would finish our Advent series. Um, but, I mean, I, you couldn't have drawn it up any better. Uh, as Roger and Jamie and the part of Mary and Joseph uh, were, were reading through, I don't know if you picked it up or not, but as they were taking turns, their last uh, uh, dialogue there, as they were taking turns reading, Roger was literally reading John 3.16. And, and we're going to pick up this morning where we left off last week, and we'll start in John 3.16. But last week together, uh, as we were continuing to examine uh, Christmas in the Gospel of John, we started the first week of our Advent series looking at the eternality of Christmas, John 1, 1 through 5, and just examining the fact that Christmas always has been in eternity past, and Christmas always will be eternity future, because Christmas isn't a season, it isn't a holiday, it's a person, Jesus Christ. And from there, we, we looked at the physical expression of Christmas, and that was God in the flesh, right? He became flesh and dwelt among us, John 14. And, and from there we went to John 1, 29, and we looked at John's proclamation. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then last week, as we've alluded to in John chapter 3, we examined this dialogue, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, a religious leader, and we, we had called that together the mystery of Christmas, and where we landed is ultimately Christmas is not a mystery at all. There is some mystery in terms of how dead things are made alive. When I say things, I mean people. And I don't mean physically. I, of course, mean spiritually. There is some mystery around the reality that God, when we believe in him by faith, makes us spiritually alive and makes us part of the family of God. Um, this is mysterious in the sense that you can't touch it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, you can't see it. Um, but it's not mysterious in the sense that it has been revealed to us. It has been clarified for us from God's word. This is a reality. And this conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus, it ended last week uh, with a call to be born again. A call to be born again that you might have eternal life. There are only two spiritual realities that every single person is a part of one of. There is no middle ground. There is no kind of, kind of, in, out. There are two realities. There is spiritual death and spiritual life. And every person, pers person, person is literally spiritually alive or spiritually dead. And as Jesus unpacks this mystery for Nicodemus, he invites Nicodemus to be made spiritually alive. That's what it is to be born again. And Jesus finished that conversation by explaining to Nicodemus what is at stake and how it is the invitation to be born again is accomplished. What's at stake? Eternity. Eternal life. Spiritual life is what is at stake. Those who believe and receive Jesus Christ for their salvation receive eternal life through him. And Jesus further clarified in finishing that portion of his conversation with Nicodemus that this takes place 
through the Son of Man being lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. And again, we saw last week that in the book of Numbers, as this interaction was taking place, and the people were grumbling, and they were moaning, and God sent serpents to bite the people. And when the serpents bit them, the people died in the wilderness. But then God... In his grace and in his mercy, he's, there's a bronze serpent, and Moses puts it up on a hole, and the, and, and the instruction for them is, look upon the bronze servant, serpent, and even though you've been bitten, you will live. You will not die from having been bit by this serpent. That's the context as Jesus talks about Moses lifting up the serpent, and people being saved from physical death when they look upon the serpent. But when those who look upon Jesus... That is to say, those who believe in Jesus, not just make eye contact with, not just look at a cross that's behind the board, not just look at a cross, not just look at the things of Scripture, but that when a person believes, when they look upon the Son Jesus and believe with their heart that he is who he said he is, that he accomplished what he said he accomplished, that God rose him from the grave, you'll be saved from spiritual death. And I want you to know and understand something this morning. There's a reality every one of us understands. That reality is physical death. Every one of us in this room has lost a loved one. Every one of us in this room has had to go through the painful process of seeing and experiencing someone we're close to physically dying. And it's awful. It is by far one of the worst parts of being a pastor is sitting with families who are grieving and who are mourning the reality of the imminence of a physical death of one of their loved ones. And so this is something we, we all understand. But I think what we tend to be a little more cloudy around or about in thinking and trying to understand is the reality of spiritual death. We are all, until we believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, spiritually dead. And Jesus, he, he, he picks up this conversation this morning. Well, we'll pick it up. Their conversation was ongoing with Nicodemus. And so as he continues in this conversation with Nicodemus, and he's talking about spiritual death and spiritual life, he, he begins to elaborate on what it means and what it is that he's specifically referencing when he talks about the Son of Man being lifted up. There's some needed information here that must be understood when it comes to being born again. And we pick up our text this morning in what I would submit to you is probably the most well-known Bible verse that there is. Even people who don't really know their Bibles know or at least have heard or have some idea about John 3.16. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not. Probably it wasn't that long ago. But in January, on January 8th in 2009, the Florida Gators played the University of Alabama for a national football title on national TV. And it started much before this, but... Tim Tebow, many of you know Tim Tebow, he began writing scripture verses on his eye blacks. And eye blacks was just a sticker that they would put underneath their eyes and it helps reduce glare from lights, okay? And so he had begun writing uh, Bible verses on his eye black. And for most of the season, he had uh, Philippians 4.13. But ahead of the SEC championship game and then the BCS championship, the, the overall championship game, he switched to putting John 3.16 on his eye blacks. I don't know who does this studying, or I don't know who does these surveys and how they determine this information, I guess probably just with a time stamp. But during the national championship game, roughly a three and a half hour window, on January 8, 2009, 94 million people Googled John 3.16. 94 million people around the world Googled John 3.16. That's a lot of people in the span of one football game who learned, maybe for the first time saw, read, interacted with, or perhaps were reminded of what Tim Tebow would later say is ultimately the, the verse that describes the hope of humanity. He said, this is the hope of humanity. 
Many who know, who, excuse me, many who know very little to nothing of God's word in that moment interacted with John 3.16. And it will serve this morning as our launching point of our time together as we finish our Advent series. And so I want to read our text together. And then what I want to do is we're going to read our text and I just want to walk through the five verses. And then I'm going to finish with a couple of points of application and that will be it for our time and our Advent series in 2023. So I'd invite you to turn your attention to John chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So what we have here, I want to take a second to, to share a reality. A lot of people, 94 million, on January 8, 2019, Googled John 3.16. What the statistics don't tell us is how many of them then read verse 17, 18, 19, we don't have any idea how much more they read. We have no idea what kind of context people are reading John 3, 16 in and understanding and interpreting what it means. And this morning, we want to go from just simply knowing the most popular, uh, arguably the most popular Bible verse, to having an understanding of what is, is actually taking place. And what is it that Jesus is talking about? And we started doing that last week when we looked at this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And as we begin in verse 16, it looks back to verse 15. Jesus, at this point, in his concluding thought with Nicodemus, he says that as the Son of Man is lifted up, verse 15, that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. Now, one thing, I don't know if you've thought about this or not, as you've, if, if you're familiar with God's word and you know Nicodemus is John chapter 3, Jesus is still talking to Nicodemus. Our context has not changed. The, 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 the circumstances, the situation, they've not changed. Jesus is still interacting with Nicodemus. And so as we begin in verse 16, like we've said, it looks back to verse 15, that whoever believes in him, the Son of Man lifted up just as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his Son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. It is clear here that what is at stake for Nicodemus and anyone else who hears is eternal life. This is what's at stake. And I want to just pause for a second because you undoubtedly in your life up to this point and going forward will have to make tons of decisions. You will have to make all kinds of super important decisions. If, if you're an adult, you understand the magnitude of that when you just think, man, you're wearing a lot of hats, you're making a lot of choices, you're doing a lot of things. As a kid, you still make choices, they're different. You still have to navigate through life. You still have to deal with whatever is presented to you. But I want you to know, and not to minimize any of the choices that any of you have to make. None of the choices that you have to make up to this point in your life or going forward in your life are as paramount as the choice or the decision of, of what it is you will believe to be true about Jesus. This is the most pivotal decision you will ever make in your life. And I also want you to know that as you think about making this choice, you've now heard... There's no such thing as not making a choice. To simply do nothing or to try to abdicate the responsibility of, of, of understanding, of hearing, believing, choosing, 
you, you don't have that option. Abdicating your responsibility is not an option. By the time we make our way through this this morning, and looking back to last week, but you don't have to have been here last week, but when we look at this picture as a whole, the reality is this. Every single person is separated from God because of sin. We are born that way. We have a sin nature because of all the way back in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. We are born with this sin nature. And when Jesus talks about being saved and receiving eternal life, we're dealing with that sin nature that has separated us from God. And the greatest decision that you will ever make in your life, as we've said, is what do I believe to be true about Jesus? Because it's the only way that your sin debt is dealt with. It's the only way that eternal life is received. And the reality is that God so loved that he gave to deal with your sin debt. He gave to deal with the dilemma and the plight that you, me, and every other human being faces. We're separated from God. And so what is at stake for Nicodemus and you and I and anyone else who is hearing this conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus? What's at stake is eternal life. And when we think of eternal life, it's important that we have an understanding. Because when we think about eternal life, most of us, if you're like me anyways, you tend to think of the future. You tend, to, you tend to think of being born again or being saved as Jesus is interacting with Nicodemus and knowing that because of that you have the promise of spending eternity in heaven with Jesus. And that's true. But the concept of eternal life didn't begin there. You see, the closest thing that we can understand or imagine about what eternal life is like with God actually began in the garden. Way back in the beginning, when God created on day six, the pinnacle of his creation, he made Adam, and then he caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he made Eve, because it was not good that man should be alone. The Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve were created, they lived in perfect harmony and fellowship with God, in a place that was perfect. Now, we could spend all the time in the world today, tomorrow, the next day, trying to imagine what it would have been like to live in a place that was perfect with a perfect, uninterrupted relationship and fellowship with the God of the universe, and we really can't compute. It really doesn't compute in our minds. But nonetheless, this is the picture of this perfection, this eternal life in the presence of God. But all of that went out the window when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. That harmony and fellowship, that promise of perfection was broken. And now man doesn't have the hope of eternal life in the presence of God in perfect fellowship. Because our fellowship, the day we are born, is broken. We're separated from God. And the amazing thing about this whole conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus and the consequences of it today are that God didn't have to do any of it. God did not have to make a way for you and I to be saved from the penalty of sin. God did not have to make a way for you and I to be redeemed, that is to be bought back into a relationship with him in order that we might have eternal life in his presence. God didn't have to do any of that. And I know we don't talk often today about some of these realities of God. We've, we've reduced God today to this big guy in the sky who just loves everyone and loves everything. And I'm sorry, I don't want, I'm not sorry, I don't want to be crass though. That's not a biblical picture of God. What the Bible tells us about God is that he so loved that he gave. He didn't have to. He didn't need to. But he chose to. Would have been perfectly justified to leave every one of us in our sin and then judge us for it 
for all of eternity. He was perfectly justified to do this. That we would live in hopelessness, separated from him. But he didn't. He didn't. He was motivated to make a way for man to be returned to that fellowship with him. What motivates the offended party? That's the, the reality of the situation. Sin has offended God. God is the one who has been done wrong, and yet God is the one who makes the way for the situation to be made right. Listen, my kids are 11, 9, and 7. And I can honestly tell you the primary thing we preach in our house to our kids is, is like, well, she did this. She did this. She needs to make this right. She needs to deal with this. Yeah, when we're dealing with our kids, those things are true. But somehow in his grace and in his mercy and in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite love, God, the one who was offended, didn't look at you and me and say, you need to fix this. He didn't look at us and say, you got to figure this out. This is what you have to do in order to have that relationship restored so that you can have eternal life. No, God's word tells us that he looked upon us and he had such love, such compassion, such grace, such mercy that he did what? He gave. He didn't say, you owe me. He said, I'm going to do this for you. He loved, so he gave. Love was what motivated him. His great love compelled him to give. I love to get gifts. My wife would tell you, that's, that's my love language. I love to give gifts, and I love to get gifts. That's my love language. And that's what God did. He gave. He gave. And when he gave, he withheld no expense. He didn't say, well, we could do this, we could do that. He gave the very thing that any person with a child could never fathom giving up. There is nothing worse as a parent than the thought of something happening to your children. And yet the very thing that God gave was his son, his only son, because he loved because we had a need. And John tells us here in verse 17 that his son was not given to condemn the world, but why was he given to save the world? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that through him the world might be saved. God didn't send his son to condemn the world because I need you to understand something. We're already condemned. The world's already condemned. God, if, if God sending Jesus was to judge the world then, he would have come in and wiped us all out. But that's not what happened. Because the world was already in a state of condemnation because of the presence of sin. So Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Because as we've alluded to, apart from Jesus, you, me, and everyone else were under the judgment of God. He didn't have to come to condemn us or to judge us because we're already condemned because of sin and we're already under the prospect of God's judgment. But this is why we must be born again. This is why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Again, in God and his grace and in his mercy, he's not called us to be born again and not told us how to do it. He's not left us in the cold to, to figure it out. He's not left us in the dark. You better figure this out or you're going to be in big trouble. God has shown us our need and then motivated by his love, he met our need by giving his son the greatest gift that's ever been give, given. And the, the sad thing for me is the familiarity of that statement robs people of the impact of it. God so loved, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Oh yeah, we know that. If you've been around church for very long at all, you know that. And it's something that we say, we hear, and we gloss right over. I don't know why, when we were down here, and I think it was the second time we started to sing congregationally, and we were singing, what child is this? I literally felt myself almost become a little bit emotional as I was thinking about the reality of that baby being born, 
The baby being born in a manger for the purpose of redeeming. I don't want to sound in- inclusive or selfish or arrogant or narcissistic or any of those things when I say this, but, but I was redeemed by my faith in the baby who was born in a manger. And we sing, what child is this? When you looked upon him, he was just a baby. He didn't look different. He didn't act different. He wasn't special in the sense that he was a a different breed of human. He was a baby. And he was the greatest gift that was ever given. And so John continues on. And he invites, makes this invitation, this declaration. Whoever believes in him. right? He says, he come into the world not to condemn it, but to save it through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned. There's the dichotomy, condemned, not condemned. How is it that we're not condemned? Well, we believe in him, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed. John goes on and tells us this reality of condemnation. But those who do not believe, they are condemned. And you and I this morning, we alluded to this a minute ago, we've been told, we've heard, if you had never heard before today, and that's a possibility, I don't want to minimize that. You maybe never heard before today that you were guilty before the God of the universe because of your sin. Before today, you may have never heard that you offended a holy, sovereign God because of the presence of sin in your life. But now, you and I, we know it. Because we've looked at this reality from God's word. And we talked last week about the mystery of Christmas. Us being condemned is not a mystery. And the truth of the situation is that people will be judged because God has given what is needed to be saved. People say, well, what kind of loving God judges people? The kind who says, this is how you're saved from the penalty of your sin. And you refuse to be saved from the penalty of your sin. It's just like being a parent. When I tell my kids, don't do that, this is the consequence, and they do it, am I loving my kids when I say, well, better luck next time? No, absolutely not. As a parent, as somebody who is in authority or in charge, when I give my kids guidelines and they deviate from those guidelines, there's consequences. That sounds kind of crazy, don't it? Because we're talking about like, you know, spiritual death in eternity separated from God, that's a pretty significant consequence. Yeah, it is. But that's because God has given a pretty significant gift that we might be spared from that consequence. It's not because God is mean. It's not because God is unfair that sin is punished. It's actually because God is fair that sin is punished. And so the truth of the situation is people are judged because God has given what's needed to be saved and we've refused to receive it. They're judged because they reject the gift that God has sent to them. And in what is perhaps the most in-your-face portion of our passage, John tells us what people remain under the judgment of God. He says, again, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son. And this is the judgment. This is what you're guilty of. The light has come into the world, listen, and people loved the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their works were evil. You see, when you're judged for your sin, it's not because God's unfair. It's because you love darkness and you stay, you remain in the darkness and you pursue your evil works and your evil deeds. Those who are judged are judged ultimately because they love darkness more than they love light. Recall back in John 1, we were talking about the eternality of Jesus. We were talking about this this conversation about life, right? The word was coming to bring life. And it was light, John John 1, excuse me, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And this is the judgment. 
People love darkness and their deeds are evil, so they refuse to believe in the Son. This is not God being unfair. This is not God being unjust. This is the reality that when we hear and we refuse to come out of the darkness into the light, when we refuse to believe, it's because we have only evil and wickedness in our heart and we love the darkness. John does a great job here of demonstrating the twofold option when it comes to Jesus. Just as there is spiritual death and spiritual life, there's only two options. We've said this when it comes to Jesus. There is no indifference. Again, John says, those who are under God's judgment love the darkness and their deeds are evil. Those who do not believe choose not to do so because you can't love God and the things of the world. You can't love darkness and love God. It's one or the other. And so John does a great job of really drawing a line in the sand, if we could put it that way. And giving you and I the opportunity to consider which side of that line we're on. Have we come out of the darkness and believed in Jesus for salvation? Or are we, have we remained in the darkness? Do we continue to pursue uh, the evil deeds of our flesh and ultimately our evil desires of the darkness? Because we can't love both. There's a line there. And John goes on to say in verse 20, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Those who love darkness stay in darkness. Because in the darkness, things are not exposed. For a while. For a while. Ultimately, God's word tells us our sin will find us out. Our deeds might be concealed in the darkness for a little while, but eventually the light will in some way, shape, or form shine upon the deeds and expose them. And for some people, that light won't shine until they've died physically and they stand before Jesus and they're judged for their sin. The light may not shine into the darkness of your life while you're alive, but that does not mean that the light will not shine into the darkness of your life. It's coming. It's coming. And it's either coming because we've believed in Jesus and we've said, bring the light, expose the darkness, expose the evilness, deal with it that I might look upon Jesus just as the Israelites had to look upon the serpent in the wilderness. Let me look upon Jesus and believe in him that the darkness can be dealt with, that the darkness can be eradicated, that I can live in light and that I can pursue the things of the light. That's option one. Option two we've alluded to already is the light will shine in the darkness when we stand before Jesus. If someone is to come out of the darkness, it requires that the darkness be exposed. And I'm going to tell all of y'all this morning, because, look, when, I, when I'm in a room this size with this many people, I refuse to believe every statistic, every metric in the world would tell us, every, we, are on, we are not all believers in Jesus. I don't know all of y'all's hearts, so I don't have anybody in mind when I say that, but just statistically, it's not practical for us to think everybody in this room has placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that their sins have been forgiven by faith, and that they have received the gift of, gift of eternal life. That's what the statistics would tell us. And, and, if, and if you're here this morning and you hear me say that, and you know I'm talking about you, I want you to know something. Coming out of the darkness is scary. Man, it is so hard to say, if I take this step and I acknowledge publicly that I believe who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, it's going to reveal some things about my life. And there's going to be some things I've got to deal with. Listen, that's scary. And that's difficult. But you know what's more scary and you know what's more difficult? Staying in the darkness and ultimately being judged 
for your own sin. Instead of your, your sin being judged when it was poured out, when the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus at the cross of Calvary, instead of that being where your sin is dealt with, it's going to be dealt with in your own body. It's going to be dealt with for, for all of eternity. Yes, there's shame and embarrassment that comes with coming out of the darkness and into the light. I can't overstate the reality that what is being communicated is that for these folks who refuse to come out of the darkness, even if the reason is shame, embarrassment, fear, whatever it is, what's ultimately being communicated is that the love for the darkness is greater than the love for the light. Because I'm here to tell you, when you come to know and understand who Jesus Christ is, and what Jesus Christ has done, and how desperately you needed it, there is no amount of darkness that you won't be willing to expose. And that's the reality. Oftentimes we say, I, I, the, the fear and the shame and the embarrassment, all these things, they're too much, so I'm going to stay in the darkness. Ultimately, we're acknowledging that we love the darkness more than what the light affords God's word tells us the light exposes the darkness. And where the rubber meets the road is that a person's response to the darkness reveals their spiritual condition. See, you can't, you, you can fool me. You can fool your neighbor. You might be able to fool your spouse if you're married. You can't fool your kids. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Like, you can't. And more importantly, you can't fool God. You can say you love the light. You can say you know Jesus. You can say you believe. You can say anything you want to say. But are the deeds of your life deeds fit for darkness? Are deeds fit for light? That's where the rubber meets the road. Those who are born again seek truth. And they allow the truth to work in their hearts and in their lives to change them to be more like Jesus. Even though it's difficult, even though it's scary, even though it's hard, even though it may be embarrassing. Those who are not born again refuse and reject truth. And in doing so, they remain in the darkness and continue to be under the judgment of God. But I want to remind you, I've already said it, but it's worth saying again this morning. Whatever darkness may be exposed in your life, if the light shines upon it, it's worth it. It's worth it. One of the hardest conversations I ever had in my life, many of you have probably heard this story, but I'm going to tell you this again. One of the hardest conversations I ever had in my life was with my older brother. And many of you know that my older brother is incarcerated. And uh, he maintains his innocence, and that's okay, that's fine. Um, I don't know if he did it or if he didn't, but he maintains his innocence. And shortly after he was convicted and he was in jail or prison, uh, him and I had, were having a conversation, and I told him one day, I said, you know, you maintain that you're innocent. I have no reason not to believe you. And I said, but if you are not in prison because you are serving time to, to pay for a crime that you have committed... You're there for another reason. I said, and I don't know completely how God works and what God does and exactly what God's plan is for you. But I absolutely believe that God could have you there that you might see your need for him. The reality for my brother, as you think about this, this, this coming out of the darkness and the, and the difficulty and some of those things, like that's a hard conversation. It's a hard conversation for me to look at my brother and say, I would rather, I would rather you stay in prison even if you didn't commit the crime. If you don't see your need for Jesus, then I would you get out without Jesus, okay, and continue in your old life. I've told him, I will pray that you are there until you find what you need. In the darkness, man, it's got to be exposed. And that was a hard conversation to have. And it's a hard situation to be in where the darkness needs to be exposed. But it's worth it. 
I know sometimes it doesn't compute, but it's worth it. If my brother spends the next 25 years of his life in a maximum security prison and comes out the other side having not committed the crimes but, know, but knows Jesus Christ as his Savior, it's worth it. Now, I don't know how to compute that other than to begin to try to understand the value of eternal life in Christ Jesus. And some of us this morning, we may be in a place where we say, I can't deal with this darkness. I, 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 can't, I can't put this out there. I can't work through this. I can't, I don't know. But whatever comes as a result of you shining the light into the darkness, God's word tells us it's worth it. And the exposure of sin via the light is not about shame and embarrassment. It's proof of God's love. When we deal with sin, when we come out of the darkness, it's not about shame, it's about grace. It's about mercy. It's about the love of God for sinners who are separated from him. The light is God revealing his love. People who are in darkness, they can come out of that darkness and they can come into the light and they can receive, as Jesus has talked about, the gift of eternal life. They're born again. There is no time for gifts like Christmas time. I, I don't, I mean, even I think about like in our lives, even when we do birthdays, there is no time in which there is a presentation and a sharing of gifts like Christmas. I assume that's probably the case for you as well this morning. No time like Christmas to give gifts. And according to God's word, you and I have a great need. And that is why God has given the greatest of gifts. Paul told the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. He says this is a gift of God. A gift is something that you do not earn. A gift is something that you don't deserve. A gift is something that someone gives solely out of their own discretion to give you something. And God's word tells us that salvation in Jesus Christ is a gift from God. We talked a few weeks ago. We painted a picture, right, of a gift under a Christmas tree. That there's a box with everybody's name written on it. And inside that box is eternal life. It's not enough to know that there's a box there. It's not enough to know that God has placed the gift of eternal life underneath our Christmas trees. It's something that has to be believed. How do I, what's the evidence that I believe that there's a box with my name on it that contains eternal life? I go and I get it. I come out of the darkness and into the light. I receive the gift that God has given so freely. The greatest gift to be given at the greatest time to give gifts is the gift of salvation. And it leads us to our first application. I want you to understand. Click that for me, Aaron, will you please? Thank you. When you understand how great your need is, you then understand how great the gift is. See, I'm convinced for a lot of folks, the gift of salvation isn't a big deal because the reality of your sin is not a big deal. You hear people say things all the time. Me and God, we got an understanding. We've got it worked out. We're on the same page. Fill in the blank, whatever, whatever you've heard. No, no, that's a minimizing of the presence of sin in your life. That's a minimizing of the offense that sin is to God. We'll never see our need to be saved from something that we don't think is that big of a deal. If all roads lead to Rome anyways, eventually we all get to heaven, so how I get there doesn't really matter. That's unbiblical, ungodly, and straight from the pit of hell. All roads do not lead to Rome. There are not numerous ways to heaven. There are not multiple ways that you receive eternal life. There is one. There is one road. There is one gift. There is one way. His name is Jesus. And I got to level with you this morning. 
If you've not believed in Jesus for your salvation and you don't, refu- and you don't believe in Jesus for your salvation, if you refuse or reject, was what we would say, then you are, as John says here, condemned. You've remained in your state of condemnation and the only thing awaiting you is the judgment of God for your sin. The more you understand that reality, the more precious salvation and eternal life through Christ Jesus becomes. The closer you get to God, the more you become aware of his holiness, the greater you will be in your disgust towards your sinfulness. You're content to stay in the darkness and live your evil deeds because you don't think it's that big of a deal to God. The darkness was so great of a deal that God sent his only son that whosoever would believe in him would receive eternal life. This morning is Christmas Eve. Tomorrow's Christmas. The greatest gift that you can receive if you have not done so is salvation through Jesus Christ. And perhaps this morning what you need to be mindful of, what you need to think about, is how great the gift of salvation is in light of the magnitude of just how sinfulness you are, or how sinful you are. Number two, the gift that is Jesus was given to expose darkness and bring people out of the darkness, not just as salvation, oh, I don't have to go to hell, but it's sanctification. Yeah, we got to come out of the darkness initially for that salvation, okay? But listen, for the rest of your life, as you strive to walk with Jesus and follow him, darkness will continue to be revealed. Pastor Brad Bigney once said, our hearts are little idol factories. They just create idols. They just expose or they just enclose darkness. But the reality of salvation and the gift of God is that that darkness is readily exposed by the light and it's dealt with and we're conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is our sanctification. This is the ongoing gift, if we could say that, of God working in our lives to make us more like Jesus. And so I would ask you this morning, almost generically, Have you received the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus? John 3 closes with a statement that encapsulates the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus very well. Verse 36 of John 3 says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Whoever does not obey the Son. Your obedience is a marker to life. Your obedience is a marker to the fact that you are in the light. That's the summation of this conversation. John adds this summary. Jesus is done talking by that point. But you will not receive this Christmas or any other Christmas a gift more necessary than the gift of eternal life. And if you are here this morning and you have not yet received this gift, do not leave today without it. This is the reason for the season. This is the truth, the reality of Christmas. The gift that God has given was given not so it could dominate November and December on our calendar, not so that we can dress up, not so that we can have a choir, not so that our kids can be cute animals, not so that we can have Christmas trees, not so that we can have lights, not so that we can do all the things, not so that we can spend all the time with our family. This season is about eternal life. And if you don't have it, you're missing the point. It's the reason for the season. And so if you've received this gift, make sure that you're seeking to understand it. Once you have the gift, it's only the beginning. And so this morning as we think about Christmas, praise God for the gift of His Son. The greatest and most necessary of all the gifts that ever have or ever will be given. Let's pray. God, I do thank you this morning for the greatest gift that has ever been given. 
I thank you this morning, God, for your son, Jesus Christ, who you gave because you loved. We were hopeless and helpless. We could do nothing to change our condition before you. And your word tells us that you loved. And because you loved, you gave your son that whosoever believes, not only will he not perish, but he'll have eternal life. Challenge our hearts today, God. Because the reality of this situation is we've either been born again or we have not. We either have spiritual life or we are spiritually dead. And so we ask today, God, that you would work in our hearts, that we would understand this, perhaps in a way we've not understood it before, that you would stir our hearts to consider some of these realities. And though after being in church for 45 minutes, we don't have all the answers, we don't understand everything, we may not know the, the full scope, breadth, and width of this reality of eternal life in Jesus, but God, this is absolutely where it starts. And so challenge our hearts today to consider God, the greatest gift that has ever been given and what our response to it is. Father, we do praise and thank you today for the opportunity that we have to celebrate, for the privilege that it is to worship and, God, to sing and to consider eternal life in Christ Jesus. This morning, I pray, God, that we would earnestly as individuals be able to say that we love you, God, and we are so thankful for bringing us out of the darkness and into your marvelous light. Work in our hearts, God, for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.